Well, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for being here. Before we get into, into the regulatory state or this deregulatory moment that CEI has explained it as, Kent, why don't you first, uh, John talked a little bit about, about CEI, but give the folks a little bit more information and knowledge about CEI. I know you all well. I have worked well with you. I actually blame you all for getting me involved <laughs> in this fight. So, so um, tell us a little bit more about CEI. I, I would love to do that, and if it's all right with you, I'm going to take a, the prerogative of telling a quick story, a quick story about John Caldera. Oh, God. Wait, 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 wait. Stop recording. Stop <laughs> recording. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's bigger than John. It's about II, and it was about 15 years ago, uh, one of my visits to Colorado. I was out here, and I was staying uh, up the road at the Boulderado, and II was a small organization hosting a very large national meeting of state think tanks, the State Policy Network. And late in the evening, one of those nights, I went down to the bar, and John was there holding court with Fred Smith. Fred Smith is the founder of CEI, uh, one of my predecessors. And these two guys had cigars and whiskey, and they had a court in front of them of all these young policy and communications people and the one message, and I, I distinctly remember this message, I've talked to Fred about it, uh, I've never had a chance to tell John about it, but the one message they were giving these kids over and over again was, you can win. You can win if you go out there and do something more than talk about your ideas. It's not enough to take a book off the shelf by Hayek and throw it at somebody. <laughs> you gotta go out there. You gotta have the petitions. You gotta file the comments. You gotta be engaged in the campaigns in whatever form they take. And that has been uh, a singular moment in the development of my policy career. It's also one of the attractive things that brought me to CEI uh, those many years later. So at CEI, we do regulatory law. We're focused on making markets work, which is a way of saying, I believe that most people, most of the time, they're going to make really good decisions about their lives. And when they do that, things work out well. And regulatory law is a way of somebody else telling you how to organize your life. Well, it's no wonder they think you're radical in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us about this. Talk about this moment right now in time. Um, actually, before we get to that, talk about the, a little bit of the history of the regulatory state. I think under the Obama administration, something called the Federal Registry, what it, what what is that, but it got up to, whatever it is, it got up to 90 plus thousand pages. It was at a historical high. What, what is that and what is this regulatory state that we know we have to deal with, but it's so hard to quantify? Wow, uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> okay. do, do your elevator pitch. Yeah. So the, the Code of Federal Reg uh, Regulation is published and the idea, it, it goes, it's this progressive notion, it goes back uh, 140 years, that we ought to put things out and be transparent with our government. That in itself is not a bad idea. The CFR, uh, we, have, we have literally have someone track this every day. Um, he wakes up and the first thing he does at work is look at the CFR, what came out the day before. And typically there's anywhere between uh, three or four and upwards of a dozen new postings. Now these can be notices, so an agency can say, we're about to regulate, we're getting ready, here's our schedule. They can be draft rules, which can run in uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages. Uh, everything from how your dry cleaner disposes of chemicals to uh, the width of the roadways to how you might develop an energy resource. Uh, and then there are final rules. And when the final rules come out, they, they must publish the comments as well, the comments that come in from the public. This is not to say that they take into account all of the public comments. The regulatory state uh, has a long and, I would say, even noble tradition. There's two, two meanings of that word, to regulate. One is to make regular, which is to say, what can we all agree on so that we don't bump into each other going about our lives? The notion of trespass or getting in the way of someone else. And the other is to tell someone how to behave. 
I shall regulate your breakfast consumption this morning by keeping you from the coffee. Well, that would be bad. B bad for everyone. Um, and go ahead. It, it's the regulatory state when we talk about the administrative state, when we talk about the bureaucracy. This is an Im embedded, extra constitutional, uh, at least at the federal level. In some states we have a, a, a slightly different setup, but an extra constitutional form of government. And it results in the single most important, the primary way most people interact with their government today. It's not through their elected officials and the laws that are written. Yeah, we can, uh, we can attest to that here at the Independence Institute and, and getting involved in the regulatory state in Colorado. Um, let's, let's get into, uh, so I started following this a lot during the Obama administration and I did this as, as a mom. I, I started noticing that my dishwasher at home was, it wasn't cleaning well. And I thought, gosh darn it, I need a new dishwasher. And so I, you know, I'm having this argument about, but it isn't that old and yada, yada, yada. So I start doing some digging just to kind of find out about dishwashers. And what I found out is actually the EPA had banned uh, uh, phosphates from residential dishwashing soap, but not from commercial. So how, so, so if you're in a, if you're just an average, you know, working mom or dad, and you just want to clean your dishwash, you just want to clean your dishes, you can't use dishwasher soap with phosphates. But apparently it's okay for restaurants to use dishwashing soap with phosphates because, of course, it actually cleans dishes. So um, a friend of mine said, well, here's what you can do. You just go to uh, a, a commercial supply company, and I had to buy a case of dishwasher soap. But it's something like that. So instead of going to the grocery store and buying a box of Cascade, I was buying cases of them and storing them in my basement so I could get my dishes clean. Of course, it was more expensive. And this is, I guess, the, the point I'm making is you guys have actually kind of quantified how much this whole regulatory state, so this 90 plus thousand pages of the federal registry, what is it costing the average American household? I just brought up one, but we could go through, you know, paint, get, just getting somebody to paint your house or anything else. So the low end estimate, I want to start there. Okay, the so we feel better. The very low end estimate is that federal regulation is about a $1.9 trillion burden on the economy. Put this in context, all the money that is borrowed and taxed out of the economy, this is about 40% again as much. So there's, there's three ways that the government tells you how you're going to use your resources. They spend your money that they tax from you. They borrow money and pledge that someone in the future is going to pay for it. Or they regulate, which is to say, we're not going to directly spend the money. We're going to have you spend it for us. We're going to have you go buy that case of yeah, soap. Yeah, of, of, of dishwasher soap. So instead of spending $4 at the grocery store, I was spending 50 on on like eight boxes. Now, there's a, there's a great little twist and story to your dishwasher story. Uh, um, we actually have been running a campaign uh, coordinated with, with some other organizations, some liberty organizations that do a lot of grassroots work because the combination of the EPA regulation and the Department of Energy regulation, which has artificially required less electricity going into dishwashers, means that there's, there is no residential dishwasher on the market that will clean, in less than, uh, clean and dry in less than six hours although the technology's there, and these things used to be on the market. So we put together some comments, we helped people understand the fact pattern, and we encouraged them to write their own comments, very different than, please cut and paste and send this in to the EPA. And uh, about three weeks ago, I was reading through some of the, the pieces that went in, and uh, my favorite was from a lady who wrote about uh, just having twins. I, I'm a father of twins. Um, visited uh, over here with someone who is a recent grandfather of twins and anyone who has multiples in their house will tell you that it is hell. <laughs> you go months without sleep. And this woman wrote in that it wasn't the diapers, it wasn't the uh, screaming, it was the fact that they didn't 
and could not get clean bottles in time before the next kid was hungry. That was ruining her life. And she, she wanted to make sure the regulators understood this. Right? Because that's one of the unintended consequences of, of the regulatory state. You said $1.2 or $1.9 trillion. I think um, CEI actually break that down by household. It's an additional $15,000 per household burden. That, that's right. So a little more than $15,000 every single household in this country is what we all pay in order to have folks in Washington tell us how to organize our lives. Wow, so $15,000, uh, and, and the good news is President Trump ran on this, this platform of deregulation and actually passed an executive order that were issued an executive order that said for every, what is it, one new rule, you have to get rid of two. And of course, to get rid of a rule, you actually have to make it, you actually, don't you have to open up a new rule to get rid of a rule? I mean, there's... Yes. So there's, uh, there's a couple of things there packed in there, Amy, and um, I just want to touch on them. We'll go anywhere you want. Um, uh, first, I, I argue, I fervently believe, we are at a moment, a political moment and a policy moment. And those are not always the same thing, um, where deregulation is possible. And this is, this is probably a, a six to 10 year window. I think it extends beyond the president and his administration, uh, but it's a very powerful opportunity for us. And we are just carving away to creating the first foothold in the last year. And in doing so, uh, the Trump administration has actually ramped down the rate of growth. So uh, on the very best, you know, if I were here advocating for the administration, which I'm not, I would say they did three or four executive orders right out of the gate, the two for one. For every new regulation, you have to get rid of two. Uh, in the first year, they did pretty well with that. It was actually about five and a half to one that they got rid of. Uh, pretty amazing. By our calculations, about $6 billion uh, in savings from that activity in the first year. Now, I'll put that in context. Regulation still grew in this country in the last year. It's just we have a lot less growth than in the past, and it grew less relative to the size of the economy. Uh, secondly, it, it was largely the low-hanging fruit that was cultivated in the last year. It will become increasingly difficult because the major rules, the big things, the Clean Power Plan, the Waters of the United States law, CAFE standards for auto emissions. In order to change a regulation, you have to do as much work and go through as much of the process as you do to create a regulation. And that's where um, our page counts and things are fun, and they can be a rough proxy for us, but they're not the whole story. You guys, you guys, um, uh, you, well, you just touched on a couple of things, certainly one that we worked on with you all, which was the clean power plan or the not so clean power plan, costly power plan, controversial power plan, whatever you want to call it. More power for the EPA plan. <laughs> yeah, there's what, yeah, there's another one. Um, but withdrawing from Paris, can, can you touch on that a little bit? Because so, so I served with one of um, Kent's employees, Myra Nabell, uh, he was the team leader for EPA trans transition team. And if Myron calls, I'm like, absolutely. Uh, I'm happy to be a part of it. Uh, but one of the things, so all the great things that happened, but one of the single most important things that had to happen on EP from, from the perspective of those of us on the transition team was getting out of Paris. And the president did that, even though there were times going back and forth, we didn't know if he would. Yes. Um, so let me give you the big picture first, and then we can dive in a little bit about the, the practical effects. Um, for at least 25 years in this country, we have been on a escalator when it comes to international law. So, uh, local decisions have been moving up to state, state decisions 
things that are rightfully done by the state government have been moving up to regional and federal regulatory agencies. Federal regulatory agencies have been stepping out of the picture and shuffling them off on international organizations. And this process removes political accountability at each step. It removes uh, basic protections from the rule of law at each step. And at each step, surprise, surprise, it becomes more uh, socialist or more European or more government controlled. And the Paris Climate Treaty uh, or Paris Climate Agreement for my friends on the left was the apex of this process in climate change and the regulation of emissions and how they relate to uh, our uh, upper atmosphere in the ozone. The president ran an 18-month campaign, and by my accounting, he had three consistent messages for 18 months. Now, he had many messages. Uh, he had many messages in the same speech, <laughs> typically. But if you looked at that campaign, there was only three things that he said week in and week out. And one of them was about overregulation in Paris. So he went into office and he said, I'm going to get us out of this Paris agreement which we have been arguing, we have been uh, uh, trying to litigate that this is in fact a treaty and it cannot go into effect without presentment to the United States Senate. Regardless, the president said, I'm going to get us out. He came into office. There's tremendous pressure to uh, just do nothing. All he had to do was put it on the shelf and the gears would grind and we would suddenly find ourselves with very onerous restrictions on energy consumption in America, uh, self-ratchets that would mean it would become more and more onerous over time, and the largest polluters and the fastest growing economies would have no restrictions. Uh, push came to shove. We went on the air in Washington on Fox, thinking that we might hit an audience of one. And in uh, April and May of 2017, it became an open question what would happen with Paris. And on June 1st, he stood in the Rose Garden and announced that the United States would be stepping away from this international agreement that would mandate how consumers in America would use energy and electricity. So getting out of Paris, yes, it was, it was huge, huge. There, there's certainly more to go, though, on energy. I mean, uh, that is not the end of it. And, and I just want to uh, kick ourselves back just for a moment. Um, we didn't do this alone. Um, there were a handful of uh, attorneys general, which were very, very strong on this. We relied a great deal on you because um, politics being what they are, the Senate always matters. And in order to influence the Senate, you have to have a footing in states. It's not just a Washington think tank. Thank goodness. Um, and we had to go up against the counsel of all of our friends and allies who said, look, there's all these good things happening with the new administration. Don't go punch them in the nose on, on Paris. Let it slide. So uh, we had to be fearless. And it was, um, it was uncertain what the outcome was going to be. Fortunately, it went the right way. So right way on Paris, but you also brought up the Senate. Um, yes. Let's talk about uh, it, in low-hanging fruit and some of the obvious stuff. Although I just so you know, you still can't get dishwasher soap with phosphates. <laughs> I've looked. Yeah, exactly. Or, yeah, go to a commercial. You have to go to a commercial supplier and, and get it. Amy's uh, selling it out of her trunk <laughs> upstairs in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I cannot tell you the odd looks that that as my you know kids were. Why do we have a box of, of dishwasher soap? And then, of course, you get into the whole discussion of, of the overreach of government, um, which they appreciated at the age of 11. <laughs> but um, so, so we've talked about some of the low-hanging fruit. Some of the things that you're right, he, that the president campaigned on, um, <laughs> Paris, uh, Clean Power Plan, and, and, of course, Waters of the U.S., and you've mentioned a number of those. Um, and all of those are within the energy sector, and you, again, low-hanging fruit. Let's talk about it going into the future. You said this sort of six to ten year window, um, and, and, and the challenge that we have going forward. So two things. 
where else are we looking for deregulation, one? And then two, um, it, it's not enough for the president to just issue an executive order. That's right. So, so Congress. So let's talk about what do we have going in the future, and then, and then um, how do we get Congress to actually do something on this? Because without them, this is just a, I mean, we're just gyrating. So, so the second question there is much more difficult. <laughs> Let me start where you started. Uh, the politics of things. Um, so there's a, there's a handful of really good things, uh, or things pointing in the right direction. Uh, first is, I think we've started to see uh, among Democrats that they find themselves in a bind, right? So uh, thumbnail sketch of the world, you'd say, well, Republicans, they don't want to overregulate land use and they don't want to overregulate uh, the environment and Democrats they don't want to overrate high tech and they don't want to overregulate uh, a handful of other areas uh, particularly um, they, they like to regulate banks but they don't like to regulate technology and payments systems so you won't find them out there complaining about uber and whenever you have that sort of situation there's room for a deal a little bit less over here and a little bit less over there. Um, we see changes in the way the uh, state and local officials are coming to Washington. A uh, quick anecdote, Ben Sass, from neighboring, Republican from neighboring Nebraska. He told me a story recently about how four visitors to his office in the same morning were county or state officials, all of them he said, listen, these are um, government officials, these are Democrats, these are people that believe in government as a force for good to do all of the things that I think primarily should be done in the private sector. And four of them in a row came in and in their respective areas, uh, child social services and a housing person, uh, transportation person, each of them said, we're having trouble with compliance of the federal mandates. If you will vote for less money coming into our programs. Remember, this is a person who's advocating for child social services saying, I'll take less money if you, if you can get a carve out so that I don't have as much of a compliance burden. Because for all of their people and their caseload, they were having upwards of 60 to 70 percent of those people work on paperwork every single day, not going out and visiting with the kids not going out to the schools where they're checking on people in the foster care system. So I see stories like that as the anecdotes that can lead to the data for things like a BRAC style commission. BRAC, you might remember, uh, going back 25 years or so, is how we closed military bases across the country. And it required an up or down vote by the Congress. Uh, a single vote, no amendments, no special carve-outs, nothing special for a big state or a powerful senator. And I think that BRAC-style commission might be available to us on a regulatory framework. The way that we go about regulating, not individual regulations, but the process of making regulation. So a BRAC commission kind of thing. That's, it, has it been, has anybody been, have they been talking about it inside of Congress or anything? Have you heard any, like, wh is there a whisper campaign? I whisper every day. Uh, mo primarily, you see other people whispering. Yes, it, primarily you'll see this from folks. Um, so Heidi Heitkamp is a Democrat who is very frustrated that when she goes to her leadership, uh, Chuck Schumer will say, no, I'm not going to help you with that. And she says, I need to take a vote on something that's uh, at least good for the business community in my state. And so there's a frustration among a handful of non-coastal Democrats. There are folks like Angus King. Uh, he's formerly a Republican, caucuses with the Democrats, and is uh, labeled as an independent. Angus uh, is the one driving the BRAC idea, uh, former governor of Maine. Um, there are folks uh, who have uh, leadership roles uh, on this set of issues um, from from Oklahoma, uh, James Langford uh, runs a subcommittee. And I don't think he's totally on board with a BRAC-style commission, but a central tenant, which would be something like 
uh, sunset provisions for re ma regulation or major regulation, he's all about that. He'd love to see sunset provisions. So I do think there's something um, available to us. And it, it's, it's more than just on a think tank shelf, a policy paper. There are people talking about how could we, how could we move this. And that brings me to something else. Um, most of you in here, I'm sure you all uh, know already, but there's a new Supreme Court Justice nominee, and it's Judge Brett Kavanaugh. So if, if, if you are in favor of the regulatory state, and I'm not saying that anybody in this room is, but there are some people for whom the regulatory state is how they justify their existence. But uh, you might find yourself now um, looking at a Supreme Court, if, if assuming that, that uh, Judge Kavanaugh becomes Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh, that might be hostile or less friendly to the regulatory state. Um, tell us a little bit about what role the, a, uh, a new Supreme Court or a Supreme Court in the mold of, um, of more, uh, with more originalists on it, what that might do for this deregulatory moment. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you framed it that way because it's bigger than one nominee. Um, a big part of my optimism is in fact what has been happening at the circuit courts. The federal appellate courts look better and better and better on fundamental questions of how the legislature, Article I bodies, uh, Article I of the Constitution articulates what happens with the Congress, and Article II bodies, which is the executive branch and the agents of the president or the agents of your governor. Um, the relationship between the, those two parts of our government has been uh, thrown out the window and really just been run by this extra constitutional arm. Uh, I don't think of, the, think of it as the fourth branch, by the way, the regulatory state. That suggests that it doesn't matter if we have two branches or five branches or three branches as we do today in the Constitution. There's just another one. It's extra constitutional. It's illegitimate. And Brett Kavanaugh comes to the court, uh, potentially comes to the court, after what promises to be a horrific experience for he and his family. Um, by my count, as the only, only the second person in history, second only to Neil Gorsuch, who has been nominated because he's an originalist. This is different than saying he understands originalism and likes it, he reads the text and is, adheres to it. Brett Kavanaugh has been selected because of it. It's not, an it's not an accidental attribute, like he's also a tall individual. The originalism will be the guardrails that we need to, to pare back that extra constitutional work of government. He has written um, some 300 opinions as a circuit court judge. I believe about 45 of them have ruled against the government in regulatory matters. Uh, that is not to say every single one of those opinions I agree with. In fact, he ruled against us uh, well, just a few years wrong. ago <laughs> uh, on a case, a Department of Transportation case that we brought against the DOT. Um, in, a, in a one paragraph concurrence, he said, I agree with the logic of my colleague, which was disappointing to me. But he's starting from principles where he has argued for these things publicly. He has a track record saying, this is how I judge. And he would not have been picked. Uh, this is not the same as Judge Roberts becoming Chief Justice. Uh, judge Roberts is essentially a conservative, and Neil Gorsuch is an originalist. Those are two stripes of a different cat. And the originalist will be much better over the long term for protecting liberty. The conservative, I will take every day of the week every day of the week, but it's the conservative that will lead us to the vote on the health care, the 5-4 decision on health care, where ultimately the Chief Justice decided the social upheaval that would be caused by following my originalist instincts isn't worth it. And that's why we got uh, the upholding that we did. So just, I want to throw this out for everybody. Um, this is what um, 
Justice Kavanaugh, or, or not, sorry, Freudian slip, <laughs> Judge Kavanaugh wrote, however much we might sympathize or agree with EPA's policy objectives, EPA may act only within the boundaries of its statutory authority. It seems obvious, right? Yeah, so, so I want to I want to comment on that in just a moment. Um, over and over again, we go to court. Uh, at CEI, we have a public interest litigation activity. We've got attorneys who wake up every day and ask, "How can we sue the government?" And uh, nothing will. Uh, cause you more alarm than an 8, 8 a.m. email from your litigator saying, I got a great idea. <laughs> uh, fortunately, usually they do. Um, but he says, no matter our preferences about their policy objectives, we need to go back to the statute, their statutory authority. The EPA today is nearly an $8 billion organization. About 60% of that they spend directly, and about 40 to 45% they direct, they send money out to states, to regional offices, to other, to nonprofits. They give a lot of money away. We, uh, we weren't one of them, though, by the way. Not one of we, them. We didn't get any. Uh, to scientific studies, to university studies. Of that $8 billion, also about 60-40, what they spend versus what they send out, about 60%, 70%, is things that can be directly linked to what's their statutory mandate. So most of the, not most, uh, a, a plurality of the work that's coming out of the EPA is at the discretion of career EPA officials. Oh, I think this is interesting. Why don't I spend a hundred million dollars on it? It's not my money. And Judge Kavanaugh has written over and over again that it doesn't matter how worthy a cause that is, if there's not a law that directs them to do it, they ought not do it. And that's something that I think we can applaud and stand behind him on because over and over again, that's gonna accrue to our benefit when it comes to protecting liberties. So lastly, before we open it up to um, audience questions, I wanna ask this. Y you brought up Nebraska. And now we've got um, a possible Justice Kavanaugh saying EPA has to act with it within its statutory boundaries. Um, this this deregulatory moment. What does it what does it mean mean for states? Because those of us who go down to the state capitol, if we heard it once, we heard it a million times. If we don't do it now, the feds are going to come in and make us. So what does this moment in time mean to the state of Colorado or Nebraska or some other state? Well, I think the, um, th there is a core uh, communications logic that's always at work in politics, and it's the urgency of the now. And uh, regulatory law moves slowly, and it's insidious because it's nearly invisible. I think that urgency of the now about if we don't do this, the federal government will make us, there is recent evidence, there's recent history, and I mean just the last three or four years, where that argument no longer holds. It just is not true any longer. So the questions about health care, do you have to take the federal money? No. Dozen states did just fine. 18 states did just fine. Questions about EPA and um, the Clean Power Plan. No, you don't have to do that, you'll be just fine. And over and over again, across issues, uh, the next one that'll come up in, in probably about two, three months will be about cafe standards in California, about the manufacture of automobiles. Um, over and over again, we're seeing that states that stand by either their constitution or their legislative preferences, the way their legislature is being reactive to their electorate, uh, those states are turning out just fine. So in Colorado, um, this is one of the things I've said, is that, uh, and we actually had this discussion inside of transition team, especially being from Colorado and another gentleman who was from Delaware talking about, well, right now the feds under a Trump administration can't possibly be as bad as our own states. 
So, and, and the argument was, well, now at least we get to hold our state accountable. We don't have to battle the federal government. We're battling the state apparatus, which by the way, is not cheap. As you guys know, the cost of an average person just getting involved in the regulatory state is, is cost, almost, well, it's almost cost prohibitive. Um, it's hard enough for our organizations to do it, but the average person, hard to even find out where to go. I mean, yes, they make comments, but actually becoming a player in it, it's not cheap. Well, and that's by design. <laughs> right? Uh, <there laughs> to keep us out. Uh, early in my career, I used to go to these meetings of an uh, organization called NARUC, which is the, it's like a trade association for state regulators. Uh, National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. You have three here in Colorado. Uh, different states are organized differently. You have anywhere between three and seven. Um, there's 254 of these people in the country, state regulators of things like water, electricity, telecommunication services, ferry services. Here in Colorado, the, uh, the state PUC regulates um, taxi cabs, the taxi cab uh, system. Um, NARUC is, uh, God love them. It's, it's a, it's a twice-a-year vacation for these guys. They go to the best resorts in the country. And if you want to go and take part and give them a set of ideas, uh, and my job was to go and teach them about economics, uh, they send you like down the six hallways around the corner into a closet and they say, um, that's where the meeting is. You know, it's, it's just, it's the hardest thing in the world. I have my hats off every day to the folks that are doing it like II, the folks at uh, the Goldwater Institute down in Arizona, um, my friends up in Michigan do it. So it's, it's worth it. It's a place where you can have a big impact because there's so few people that actually have meaningful information and knowledge. And if you go and present a case and you have some semblance of a legal opinion behind your case, uh, you can shape a lot of law that way. So please keep it up. Keep so, doing it. Um, just to toot our own horn, so far we've saved XL rate payers $88 million. It, just in the latest, yeah, just in the latest proceeding. And that was by having an expert witness who actually found the modeling errors because somebody actually bothered to go through yeah. the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of a plan, but we saved, we've so far saved $88 million, really looking to save $2.5 but um, 88 million is a good start. I want to uh, open it up to questions. Um, okay, so. I don't see anybody over there. <laughs> All right, uh, so first question, we'll go to John and then, uh, not that I wouldn't put Antoinette first because she's prettier and kinder and everything else, but when you're jumping up and down. So two executive orders, uh, I will say last year was we were going to comply with Paris, and then this year is uh, the new executive order is to emulate California on their CAFE standards, yeah. both of which we're, we're really excited about here. <laughs> uh, on, on the first one, um, th there's this wonderful feature of our lives as Americans that we all have dual sovereignty. You're Coloradans. Uh, you also are Americans. And if he doesn't have the authority, which I don't think he does, uh, it's very plain who has treaty making authority in the United States Constitution. It's not a governor. If he doesn't have the authority, uh, I think it's up to your legislature to rein him back in. And the one, <laughs> the one branch of government checks the other. Um, as a practical matter, it would take something like the CAFE standards, which is dictating the manufacture or the consumption. You know, how do you buy something? How do you buy a car? What rating does it have to have? Um, and there, uh, I think we're going to see, um, y you might not have to do anything because it might be taken care of through uh, multi-state efforts to rein in Jerry Brown. Um, California has led the way on 
making more and more restrictive uh, combustion engine, right, and, and how it operates. Um, most of the auto manufacturers have said publicly, well, that's a little too strict, but we want to do something better. And then privately, they say, please save us. There's no way we can manufacture it like that. The technology doesn't exist. And we certainly can't manufacture for the California market and then the rest of the country. Um, if there is going to be, I I'll give you one last thought, and it's something to be pursued intellectually. I don't know that it's a path that will work yet. Uh, but if there is something to be done on um, following the California standards, I would encourage you to look closely at the implementation of the compact clause of the United States Constitution. And this is, uh, this is a clause in Article One that says if the states are going to get together, if they're going to band together, then they need permission of the federal Congress. And this was put in place to try to tamp down regional economic favoritism at the founding era. And if we have regional environmental favoritism, uh, that's something that can be used to address right now. Antoinette, you had a question? Um, you know, I'm just curious. There's a number of organizations in the West that are making a big move right now to take back our public land. You know, huge swaths of the West is owned by the federal government, which was supposed to be a temporary thing and obviously not been temporary. It would be like a sea change for us right here. There's probably 100 examples like that of, of some unexpected thing that could happen that could really move the tides for us. And I'm just wondering if there's things that are on your radar that we should know about and we could actually be supportive of if we were more aware of them. Well, um, specific project I don't have for you, Antoinette, but a, but a general comment. Uh, my approach to the federal land, the, the problem, and I think it's a, a tragedy, so it's incumbent upon us to address it. My approach to this has been um, we need multiple strategies, and what works in one place is not going to work somewhere else. So one strategy is to take, you use the phrase, take back our federal lands. And I subscribe to that. I just think there's more than one way to do it in the near term. And by near term, I'm thinking about a decade. Okay? So one path is you take uh, federal land from federal management and you ask the state to manage it. One path is you take federal land and you sell it. And I don't care who buys it. If a state buys it because the state legislature wants to spend their money that way, um, I'm a Virginia citizen and I hope they don't do it in Virginia, but other people might choose to do that, right? Uh, so you sell the land. A third is you declutter the alphabet soup of agencies that are managing lands. So if it's Fish and Wildlife, if it's Department of Agriculture, if it's the um, the folks at Interior, uh, proper, not Fish and Wildlife, straighten that out so that there's a clearer path for what management looks like. And that is, I think, a precursor to allowing us to ask and answer the question, what are our goals with federal land management? So there's a basic question. It's a 100-year-old question in this country. Are we managing toward conservation or preservation? Preservation means you don't have much to do with people. Conservation means you can have multi-use and multi-purposes and you can have people raise their hand and say, I've got a better idea, right? And I, I'm sorry, I, don't have, I can't point you toward a program or a piece of litigation. There are several organizations working on this. It's something, um, frankly, as president of CEI, uh, we've spent a disproportionate amount of energy over the last 15 years on energy policy. I don't want to ramp that down at all. I do want to grow our environmental work as it relates to property rights. And that's something that we're focused on and we're bringing, um, bringing some people on board to, to work on and focus on in the next three or four months. Steve? Yeah, we've uh, identified regulatory agencies as the culprit, but does not a lot of the blame belong to the legislators who have ceded their authority to those agencies to impose the, their devil's handiwork upon us? From your lips to God's ears, Steve. Uh, I, I think we have, two, we have, we have a double-sided uh, problem here. Um, 
our focus has been on the regulation of the regulatory agencies because that's where it impacts our life. That's where it uh, comes up contrary to law. But the double-sided problem is we have too much delegation, which is our legislatures, and I know uh, especially our federal Congress, they've forget, forgotten how to write law. They don't write law with uh, specific goals, and it, it is a reality. It is not a throwaway joke about Nancy Pelosi when Congress says, you've got to pass the thing to know what's in it. That's how they treat all of their law. Now, the reason we focus so much on regulation is last year, we had 34 regulations for every law passed by Congress. 34 to 1. So it's good that they don't pass laws anymore, like that they can't get anything passed. Well, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying the optimal number of law, or the optimal society is a, a society where we have more laws. Okay. I am saying we're having a lot of law created in this invisible sp space because of over-delegation. Now, we have a, the other side of the coin, we have a separate problem, and this is where the discussion about the Supreme Court comes in. Uh, we have too much deference given. And there's two types of, in the federal law, there's two types of deference given to regulatory agencies, both of which need to be reined in, both of which show promise. Uh, the first is called Chevron deference. This is what gets all the press. It's very attractive. Um, it's something that the late Justice Scalia was first hinting that he was going to be reconsidering. He had been the principal conservative defending Chevron deference for about 20 years. Chevron deference is where you look at an agency decision and the statute, and the courts would say, well, in this case, the agency probably has specialized knowledge, we'll defer to them, if there's a question about uh, ambiguity. There's a second type of deference, which I think is even more pernicious. It's called our deference, A, A U E R, I think it is, our deference. And that is where, if there's a question between the regulatory agency's interpretation of its own rule and the rule. Some of these rules are decades old. And then the agency will say, well, that's not what we meant. We're going to enforce this uh, uh, sanction against you. We didn't, we didn't mean that thing. Under our deference, the courts defer to the regulator. They never defer to the plaintiff who says, we were following the law the best we could, the way it's been implemented the last 20 years. Uh, now we've got this new ruling. Uh, on what it means. Both of those forms of deference need to be pulled back. Uh, but I think you're exactly right. We need to start with teaching lawmakers how to write laws that are very clear and specific and don't give away the store to unelected officials. That's why I argued in one of my, when I wrote the difference between shall and may in law matters. I, I, and when you say shall consider, the Public Utilities Commission then must consider whatever that is. You go through, I go, why do you have shall? It's all over this thing. Now you're going to make them do it, and they're making the rule then. So, um, and, and they'll say, oh, that's not really what we meant. Mr. Neely. pages. Now, how extensive a law was involved there in giving away half the country to people that all they had to do was go and sit on it for five years. They could do that in four pages, but nowadays you can't do it in 2,800 pages. So you were right in saying that Congress has forgotten or hasn't really learned how to make laws, but then that little section that they put in there can be Regulatory agencies shall issue such regulations as are necessary to carry out the intent of this law. That opens up a whole new ball game for more paperwork. What is the solution to that? Why can't we go back to the Homestead Act for pages? There's a couple things there uh, that I want to address. Um, f first, I didn't realize it was only four pages. I love that. So I'm going to borrow that anecdote. Uh, we will verify it first. John, do we have some interns around here? Use the Google machine. 
I heard it here first. Um, so there's, there's, if there's one phrase that drives me nuts, just drives me bonkers, one phrase in law, I'm not talking about what I hear from my kids. It's uh, the public interest in necessity. That phrase is plugged into laws all over the place, and it's like a get out of jail free card for lawmakers. And, and let me explain, it's not just what you're presuming, that it, it means that we get to decide whatever we want is the public interest. There's no clear definition of that. Is the public interest in favor of the people that own the rails or the people that own the cattle? Is it in, in favor of the, of the consumers in the grocery store, right? I eat hamburgers all the time. Where is the public interest there? Well, I think you sort the public interest through the market. It's really clean. It takes complex issues with lots of moving parts, and it simplifies it, and it uses the price system. It works well. Public interest and necessity is bad because it, it sets off this unintelligible, <laughs> poorly defined uh, term that allows regulators to make things up. But it also does what, what you're describing, is it punts responsibility. Now, lawmakers have a job to make law or not make law and let the rest of society sort it out. Because as I said at the beginning, I believe most people most of the time are going to make good decisions. Right? Every once in a while you get cut off in traffic, but I guarantee you most people in your neighborhood are not jerks. Most people in this room are okay, John excluded. <laughs> yeah. So uh, those sorts of phrases, um, we have to increase our awareness of and push on lawmakers to stop using. And they don't, most of them don't even know they're doing it. I guarantee you, you go talk to the congressional delegation of Colorado, uh, unless they're a committee chairman, they, they're unaware of it. Most of them are operating as uh, 20 of their 24 hours a day as constituent services or glorified welfare offices. They're not lawmakers anymore. And that's largely the function of they're doing too much law. They're, cre they're creating too much in Washington. All right, we have one last question and then we're gonna let Kent give a few last remarks like where we can go to find out like the 10 commandments of CEI on regulations and you guys, you guys have some fun things. So let's take one last question. It's, uh, it's borderline brilliant. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut no, you off. No, I was just, I, I was thinking, wow, yeah, do you, or, or do you, can you wipe out an entire agency or do you just do this, you know, slashing a regulator one at a time? So uh, th th three strategies and uh, we're trying to deploy all three and each of them requires allies and help. We see at CEI, at II, at, at the next good organization, nobody's going to do this alone. Um, the first strategy is um, it's very simple and that is to look at our Constitution which has been incorporated as law. It's uh, if you go look in uh, the statute books uh, it will say see U.S. Constitution and on about the third or fourth page, right? The Constitution says that we have law to protect our liberties, to secure our liberties. Bringing cases into court, challenging on a constitutional basis, activities of the government is a winning strategy. It's a strategy we're pursuing right now with the uh, CFPB, a new regulatory agency created out of the Dodd-Frank uh, banking law of uh, half a dozen years ago. 
It's a uh, uh, the CFPB is by the way one of the best dissents in if you if you're into legal writing, one of the best dissents on constitutional law came from a judge named Brett Kavanaugh on CFPB about uh, a year and a half ago. And I tell you, we're going to ride that one into the sunset as soon as we get him on the court. <laughs> so the first strategy is use the Constitution because it is designed to protect liberty. Um, second strategy is as a guide star to help me identify is our organization on the right track, there is a, uh, a schism in regulatory agencies, at least at the federal level. There are the executive branch agencies that have a certain set of rules for oversight and management, and then there are what are called independent agencies. The National Labor Relations Board, the Securities and Exchange Council, uh, Commission, the uh, Federal Communications Commission. There's a, there's a group of independent agencies, and they have this special status, and they have uh, more power for no good reason. I believe there's a strategy, it's going to take a while, to cut down that tree. And independent agencies, we might be able to reframe all at once. And then the, th the third strategy is, I believe, like the dishwashers, the cafe standards that make it so that you are either buying more expensive cars or not being able to buy cars when you want to because they're not available. The the nicks and cuts in the regulatory state will add up and do matter, and we need to keep telling the stories of where regulation impacts everyday life and small business owners. The, the guy that has trouble running his restaurant because of labor law and labor regulation, that's the story that's going to help change the legislative perspective. So we're out of time. Um, just give us a, a few, you know, few comments wrap this up you guys have some great things at CEI you, you have what the 10,000 commandments you also put out something regulations of the week that are kind of that kind of hilarious but also frightening so um, you'll find us at CEI.org on the internet uh, every year we do a compendium of the regulatory costs of the federal government uh, this is our 25th anniversary of that study it's called 10,000 commandments uh, I believe we have some copies in the back corner here. Um, a fan favorite, if, uh, if you give me your name or your card or, or otherwise just drop me a note, we'll make sure you get a desk calendar, which has, um, if you're into regulatory jokes, they're all in there. Uh, there we go, we got a desk calendar. Uh, we also celebrate, I just want to call out one thing about the calendar. We celebrate good things. The birth of Adam Smith is no noted in the desk calendar. And we celebrate uh, bad things. So when we won a major lawsuit against regulation. So bad guys, um, Karl Marx, his birthday is not listed. Maybe his death is listed. <laughs> Vice versa for the good guys. And um, I would also encourage you to follow along um, our, our Facebook and Twitter because that's where you find the kind of the daily outrages, the weekly compendiums. Uh, you find out where our scholars are traveling, uh, where they're partnering with folks. The energy and environment and labor law is where we're most likely to be out in states because it's easiest for us to, to collaborate with folks. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult on fundamental regulatory reform because each state has its own uh, governor and, and, and constitution and statute. And its own political drama, as we have here in Colorado. So Kent Lastman from CEI, thank you so much for being here. And thank you to all of you for being here on this, this early morning. Also, make sure you sign Fix Our Damn Roads and check us out. You can go to thinkfreedom.org, thinkfreedom.org. More burritos back in the back, coffee and orange juice and everything else. Thanks, everybody, for being here today.